Okay, so the last thing that we saw um, the last class was uh, um, essentially the swap function, right? And we showed that you can, in fact, uh, prove it by this automated technique that we've developed, which is uh, either try the syntactic rule or go ahead and try the rule that um, um, strengthens uh, the post condition. Um, you actually then apply the, you can, in fact, apply the syntactic rule. Um, and then what you do is you then go ahead and then uh, uh, discharge the constraints that you've sort of built up using uh, the SMT solver. Uh, not the SMT solver. You can, in fact, uh, discharge it using SMT solver, which is what um, um, tools that use whole logic do. But we've built a very small uh, solver here, right, using this T tactic that we've seen earlier. And that uh, discharges the tactics. And the other thing that we saw is that uh, um, you don't have to actually go through this uh, in detail. Um, you can, in fact, use Cox uh, automation abilities in order to discharge it uh, without having to go through this uh, step by step. And that is what we did uh, um, as the last step. Right? And uh, today, what we are going to do is we are going to continue looking at uh, similar things. So the first thing that uh, we are going to do is to look at more examples. In particular, I'm going to look at, um, um, here's a simple example, right? So here is a maximum of uh, two variables. So I have variable x and y, which have values a and b. I want the max value of this. Using our simple language, we can compute uh, maximum because it has uh, less than operator, right? And uh, the idea here is that the inputs for this max function that we are doing here uh, are in the variables x and y. And the output, the max value, is going to be stored in this uh, variable m, right? And uh, what we want to say is that when this function, when this, when this code snippet is done, what you will end up having is um, in the variable m, you will have the max of uh, a and b, right? So this max is, uh, um, Sort of referring to the max function within Cox, right? So we are using the um, Cox version of the max fu max function as a um, specification, and we are claiming that uh, that it, this code in fact computes the max function, right? Uh, if x is less than y, then uh, max is y. Otherwise, uh, max is x, right? Um, so okay, so let's uh, let's run through this. So you simplify the same rule, right? So this is a single command. We actually learned something more um, um, specific thanks to the syntactic uh, rule uh, of uh, the conditional. But uh, we are going to claim something weaker here. So we we say we will prove a stronger post condition. Right? So um, you get a unification variable here. We can now apply just the um, syntactic rule for if. And then for each of the cases, right? One for the true case, another for the false case. Um, so the true case is here. That uh, the um, predicate evaluates to true. And then we have the false case. And uh, both of these sort of uh, go through with just the syntactic rule for assignment. Right, we are done. We build up this uh, big expression, right? Um, you can simplify a little bit, but uh, you still end up with this expression. But uh, this is all. It involves a, a bunch of lookups in this valuation and uh, inequalities. And our solver can, a little solver can make this go through. So this one uh, makes this, makes the entire uh, um, side conditions uh, go through. And of course, as uh, earlier, we can make everything go through with just uh, this HD rule, which uh, applies the um, I mean, the idea here is to you first apply the syntactic rule. If none of the syntactic rules apply, then apply strengthen post conditions, um, which will make sure that uh, you can always apply the syntactic rule and you keep going. And then finally, you apply the solver. Right? So this makes both. Work. So these are simple functions which don't involve uh, um, any iteration. So let's look at uh, iterative factorial. Right, we are going to compute factorial uh, very similar to the one that you would uh, say write in C. In order to do that, we first want to capture the specification of uh, uh, factorial um, in a form that is uh, useful 
uh, for the horologic proof. So you can actually read these lemmas. These lemmas, proving the, these lemmas is not uh, tricky. But if you read these lemmas, it says that uh, if n is 0, then factorial of n is 1. If n is greater than 0, then the factorial of n is n times factorial of n minus 1. This is needed so that uh, we can discharge the loop invariance. Right? Um, the proof of them is very simple. I'm not going to cover them. But essentially, these two together are, in fact, capturing the factorial base case and the factorial uh, recursive case. That's the entire definition of factorial. OK. So uh, let's do that. And then what we have is we say um, factorial base, factorial recursive, uh, these two are, in fact, uh, um, going to be used as uh, rewrite rules for um, the auto tactic using linear arithmetic. If you can make this go through with linear arithmetic, then linear arithmetic, then uh, you can uh, uh, use that as a rewrite rule. Right? And uh, here is the actual function. right? First, let's ignore the uh, pre and post conditions and the loop invariant. So our input is in this function, this variable called n, right? Um, we initialize the accumulator to one, and uh, we keep uh, iterating this loop when n is uh, greater than or uh, um, greater than zero, right? And each step we reduce n, um, and then we also update the accumulator such that it's the product of the accumulator and n. Right? This is just the iterative definition of uh, a factorial. And we are done. And now let's look at uh, the pre and post condition. The pre condition says that uh, the value of n, the variable n, is some n. right? And uh, this is universally quantified. So for all n, um, let's say that the value of the n variable is n. And what it claims as a post condition is that uh, if you read the accumulator value at the end, then the accumulator is going to be factorial of n. And uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, I mean, as we've done earlier, right? So we've done uh, these sort of proofs uh, over and over again uh, in this uh, course. And the one thing that we always do is we sort of prove something about um, the body of the recursive uh, loop or the iterative loop separately, right? Um, and here is precisely uh, how that shows up in our proof. It shows up as a loop invariant. This loop invariant is a property that holds at the entry to the loop during the loop and when the loop finishes, right? It essentially claims that um, at every, I mean, the invariant for the loop is that um, you compute the you compute the product of n times accumulator, right? At uh, the entry during or after, it will be equal to the factorial of n, right? Initially, accumulator is one, so this holds, and finally, accumulator uh, holds the factorial of n. Uh, n becomes 1, right, when we exit. So that holds. And in every step, uh, this property holds. And this is the key property, the invariant that lets us, uh, loop invariant that lets us uh, actually prove this program. And this is the clever bit here, right? So as we've done previously, inferring this invariant is the clever bit. Um, it's, it's, um, it's tricky to do with just looking at the syntactic form here. Right? It has to come through. Um, somehow and uh, it is um, yeah so as i mentioned before uh, essentially this is where the um, there is a lot of open research in uh, inferring these uh, inductive invariants right so for variety of uh, uh, landscapes right so essentially in uh, program verification what we've done is we know what the program is and we have a specification in mind and we are trying to prove that specification right um, this problem of inferring the loop invariant sort of um, um, can be looked at as uh, I have a program. What is the specification for this program in a constrained language? Right. So this language has uh, assignments and so on. But our language, the logical language, does not have assignments. It has logical statements. So looking at a language, what is the specification that you can learn from it is really the challenge of uh, this uh, invariant inference. And we don't do that here, right? We are just studying uh, uh, the application of whole logic. But keep that in the back of your mind. This is like an open research question. Right, OK. Um, so now, how do we prove this? Again, we do the same uh, trick as earlier, right? Um, so we simplify it. So we have a sequencing first, right? Where is the sequencing? 
um, yeah, there is this assignment, and there is this this whole thing is the um, while loop. It is also prefixed with the um, loop invariant. Right? So let me sort of uh, push it a little bit over here. Okay, and then uh, we are going to apply the sequence rule first. And uh, first, uh, this is going to go through with the assignment rule. This whole thing, right? Where is the where is the uh, definition? So um, the definition here of the while loop, right? Is going to produce something that is uh, actually all the way through, right? So all the way through here to here. Um, is going to produce a stronger invariant. It is going to say something about uh, n as well. We only want to um, um, know something about accumulator. So as previously, we do strengthened post conditions. We will actually prove a stronger post condition. And we will show that that stronger post condition implies the weaker one that we actually want to show the high level in uh, intuitive property that we want to show. So we do that. We apply the while step. Right, that um, asks us to prove uh, um, other uh, lemmas. So there are there are three sorry other uh, sub goals. There are three uh, sub goals here. So the first one um, is just a. Um, I mean, if you read it, you will see that uh, this is just a numerical reduction and equality will make it go through. So for all of that, t actually works well. So that uh, makes it go through. Here we have two assignments. So these are uh, from the body, right? And uh, we do sequencing first, assignment for the first one. Why do we do assignment? We can see that uh, this is a unification variable, right? So we, if we apply assignment, that gets filled in. Um, and for the second one, uh, we are, uh, as uh, before, we are, uh, we will end up with a stronger invariant now. So we are going to sort of, um, um, we will, we will get a stronger post condition. And that will imply the weaker one. So I'm going to strengthen the post condition here. Right? Apply the syntactic rule for assignment. That's done. Now, if you simplify, and then uh, again, take my word for it. This, uh, if you read this closely, this will be obvious. Um, I'm not going to go through the steps here, but uh, T will make it go through. We've just built up a side constraint that we are discharging through T. And finally, the same for the last case as well. Um, and then simplify, and then uh, T will make uh, the rest of it go through as well. So um, just to show that this, uh, in fact, uh, works well with automation, here is um, here is the HD version of it, which uh, completely removes all of this intermediate uh, uh, carefully constructed steps. This uh, works just as well. right? So it takes a little bit of time, but uh, uh, this works just as well. Right? So, so here is so what we've seen is an example of uh, um, something that uh, uses loop invariance for uh, proving imperative program, right? But the one thing that we've not done so far is we have not looked at uh, manipulation of uh, the heap, right? Everything was on valuation, so we have this rich language which um, gives us the ability to reason about heaps as well. So as a single as an example, right? Here is an example that uh, actually shows you uh, the use of uh, um, whole logic for uh, proving something really interesting, right? The interesting program that we are going to prove is selection sort, right? So, um, and the particular uh, uh, instance that we are going to use is uh, here. Let me open it up. Okay. So So yeah, so the selection sort that we are going to sort of see um, is uh, exactly this. I'm using the primitives from um, um, the language that uh, we have defined, right? The constructs from the language that we have defined. I've written it uh, explicitly here just so that uh, we are not, um, we can actually see the code clearly, right? Because uh, this particular uh, loop here, right? We have two um, while loops, nested loops here. 
each of these are going to be associated with uh, quite uh, intricate uh, loop invariants. Right? I will walk through the loop invariant for uh, the outer while, um, but just to just to sort of uh, get an idea of what the code is doing, I have uh, laid it out here. Right, so we are defining a selection sort procedure um, that takes in an input array, right, uh, and uh, and uh, the size of the array n, right. And uh, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to initialize i with uh, zero, and we are going to have the outer loop uh, iterate from zero to n minus one, right. And uh, in the inner loop, I'm going to use the um, index variable j, which is i plus one. I'm going to pick the best index. The best is the least one, right? Uh, for the for the beginning, so I initialize the best with i. Right, so I would consider that uh, um, initially the value at uh, index i is going to be the smallest value, and I'm actually going to find the smallest value by in this iteration. And what I'm going to do is uh, swap the smallest index with the i value, right? So essentially, I'm going to I mean selection sort works this way, right? So at every iteration, you sort of find the smallest value, and then you uh, put it at the right position, right? So you sort of uh, Go through the list, put it at the right position, keep doing it, and uh, eventually, when you reach the end of the array, you will uh, see that the whole list is sorted, right? So this is the inner loop, right? It goes uh, up to um, j goes to n minus one at every step, right? This is very similar to the C syntax, right? So assume that this is a pointer, right? A plus j is the element, uh, is the address of the element. That is at uh, position uh, index j in the array. If the value at that position is less than the best value discovered so far, then we uh, record that the best index is j. Otherwise, we skip. We keep uh, we keep iterating through, right? J equals j plus one. We keep iterating through. At the end of this um, iteration, uh, this loop, what you will know is that. Uh, um, you will get the best index, the smallest uh, index of the smallest value in the array. Um, and what you have to do now is to actually swap the values, right? At uh, position i with the best position. So you take the best value, you store it in temp. You take i, right, the outermost one that uh, we have here. You swap it uh, to the best value, right? You actually store it to the best position and temp which is uh, the copy of the uh, smallest value, you store it in this position i, and you keep going, right? So when the loop completes, uh, the entire program is done. It is, uh, yeah, so it is sort of, uh, this is not a simple program to reason about, right? So let's uh, start there. There is a bit, there's a lot going on in that, uh, um, we are, in fact, uh, having this intuitive understanding of uh, what these loops are doing, right? We also have an intuitive understanding of how to manipulate memory, right? What these indexes mean and so on. So just to step through a simple example, um, what are the, I'll just uh, um, tell you what is the invariant that we might want to say about this outer while loop, right? So initially, i is going to be, say, the first position, 0, right? And j is going to start uh, here, and it's going to find the smallest one. That uh, position is going to be 0. And here, we are going to swap it. So 0 goes to um, position 0, and 5 is copied over there. So we get this array. And then we increment i. So i points here, right? And we are going to repeat the same process. So we are, the inner loop iterates over this position. It's going to find one as the smallest one. We're going to swap one here. Four goes over there. And hence, uh, you get 0, 1. And you keep going, right? What do we see? What are the, what are the properties that we can actually see uh, from this, right? Why do we think at the end it is sort sorted? At every iteration of the loop, we actually see that uh, whatever elements are there before i, they are, in fact, sorted, right? So these are uh, this is a sorted array. Right, zero, one are uh, um, the prefix of uh, uh, the whole array that is uh, before i is in fact sorted. 
right? That's the first observation. So when I actually reaches the end, the whole array will be sorted, right? That is what we get. And the other thing that we also know is that um, uh, it is not enough to just reason about the prefix. We also have to say that uh, um, if you compare any element here with the elements in the suffix starting from i to the end of the array, then all of those elements are going to be greater than um, the elements here, greater than or equal to the elements here. Right, so uh, this is sorted, but uh, this is not just sorted, it is sorted with all the elements here are going to be less than or equal to the elements on the suffix. Right, these are the two properties that we actually want for uh, the outermost loop so that when we reach the end, uh, everything will remain sorted. Right, so that is what uh, we are going to encode. Okay, so let's actually do that here, right? So, um, in order to do that, uh, there is a simple lemma here. Uh, it just says that if x equals y, then if you look up uh, the um, same index in m, uh, then they are less than or equal to. Actually, it is equal to, but uh, uh, we are just going to use uh, this as a proof step, right? Um, so in our proof search, if less than or equal to is there, if you if we want to show um, looking up x in m, looking up y in m, we want to show less than or equal to, then one possibility is to show that x equals y, right? That is why we are going to we are going to use this backwards, but in fact, uh, uh, we've written it this way, right? Um, yeah, so this is a lemma, that's a helper lemma. The proof is very easy, so that uh, let's, let's just uh, uh, not uh, go through it in detail. But uh, we add that as a resolution step, right? So if we want to actually, if we find that we have to prove this, we might uh, try to apply this particular lemma and try to prove that x equals y. If not, we are going to do something else, right? But that's on the side. And we have, uh, whenever we find equality of natural numbers less than or less than or equal to, we are going to try the linear arithmetic tactic. So we add that as uh, uh, external hints, right? For, uh, for the auto tactic. So that's also there. So yeah, as I mentioned, the invariants are quite hairy, right? So uh, here is the whole program. It looks a bit hairy, but uh, really, if you sort of ignore whatever is here and whatever is uh, here, those are just loop invariants. They're very complicated invariants, but uh, they're loop invariants. Um, the rest of it is the program that uh, I've described here, OK? Um, and uh, and yes, so as I mentioned before, right? So, what is uh, what are we expecting? Initially, we just expect uh, no precondition. Precondition is just true. What is the post condition that we expect? Um, in the heap and the valuation, right? For all index i and j, if i is less than j, I'm going to use i and j as indices, right? If i is less than j. And j is actually less than n, right? So essentially, what this boils down to is uh, gives you a pair of uh, indices 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, right? Um, if you have like uh, five elements in the list and 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, um, 2, 3, 2, 4, 3, 4, right? For all of those uh, um, values for i and j, if you get the, so the way to read this is that um, um, I am going to um, get the value for A, right? Firstly, I'm going to get the value for A. Uh, a is our array. The value for A is the address, right? And uh, that's the base address. Base address plus the index, right? So I sort of, uh, uh, I have done... Um, a plus i here. So the way to read this is uh, similar to a plus i here, right? So this whole thing is a plus i. And if I look up the heap value there, that is similar to dereferencing that uh, value, right? Looking up the value in that position, i, then it is always going to be less than or equal to the similar uh, value at j. Because i and j are going to be pairs of values where i is less than j up to n up to n, n minus one. So we have this property. And what does this property say? That it, it actually captures the sortedness, right? 
if for every pair of such elements this property holds then the whole array uh, represented by a is sorted right that's the post condition so yeah so the program is the same let's just look at uh, the um, loop invariant that we write for the uh, the outermost loop i'm going to leave the innermost loop uh, loop invariant as an exercise for you i'm not going to go through it in detail right um, we are going to use a similar uh, line of reasoning uh, that i mentioned here that the prefix is start sorted and uh, all the elements in the prefix are less than or equal to all the elements in the suffix uh, right so so here's the precondition i am going to say um, the index i is less than n i'm going to look up i and v right that is just going to give me the index right this is sort of uh, just reading the variable right when i write v dollar exclamation i it's just the index i value right i'm claiming that i is always less than or equal to the n value right so this is because a loop only goes up to that position right and for all i comma j pairs this is again using the same trick right i is less than j right um, and j is less than uh, this uh, index value i so i happen to use i and i mean the code use happens to use i and j again but uh, imagine that uh, these this i and j indexes uh, indices are in fact uh, referring to i and j in the prefix right some i and j in the prefix such that i is less than j right they are just indices right and uh, here what i capture is that uh, uh, similar to the post condition full post condition the uh, prefix is sorted right so the value at position i in the array is less than or equal to the value of position j in the array right that's the that's the condition that captures prefix is sorted and uh, we also need to capture the second condition pick an i that is less than uh, the current value of uh, i so um, it is a pity that it is using the same variable name i could have used other variable here these two this i and this i don't have uh, don't don't need to be the same um, character i right? so this is referring to uh, the index i here and this i refers to one of the indices here right so this can be zero or one uh, the indices can be zero or one that's the idea here so let uh, i be that index let j be such an index such that it is less than a, sorry where so it is greater than or equal to this position i right pick any j here so i happens to be one of the indices in this prefix j happens to be one of the indices in this suffix where the suffix also includes the current element here right and uh, what is the upper limit of j the upper limit of j is uh, in fact n right so we don't want to read beyond the array so the upper limit of uh, j is uh, n um, exclusive so j goes up to n minus 1 what what can we say all we can say is that uh, um, every element in the prefix is less than or equal to every element in the suffix right so that's what uh, this is capturing so similarly there are properties that are captured here about the best index as well i'm not going to explain that but once you have that uh, as you can see right there is something interesting happening on the outside but when this loop reaches um, terminates you will actually uh, know that uh, because the prefix becomes the entire list uh, the entire list is sorted right that's the idea here so the proof involves uh, a few steps right so i'm not going to go through it you can go through it in your own time and this is not uh, complicated um, but uh, but yes but uh, it's mostly automated there is a there is a little bit of extra work that we need to do for case analysis here but uh, otherwise uh, i mean it is almost automated right which is what uh, you should think about uh, think about this if you had an smt solver underneath this is all going to go through automatically right so that's done so that's the only example that we will see on uh, heap uh, manipulation right so what we've seen is a successful example where we've uh, reasoned about a non-trivial imperative algorithm, and we've shown that uh, 
this algorithm actually produces a sorted list. The one thing that we haven't done in the sortedness is we have not shown that uh, the output array that we actually get uh, here when the algorithm ends is, in fact, a permutation of the input array. We don't do that here. Uh, recall that we did that uh, for the insertion sort, right? So if you had to do that, how will you do it? It's a, it's a challenging question here because our uh, logic is, in fact, uh, a little bit uh, weak. It's not that it is impossible, but it's it's just uh, a little bit tricky and uh, our loop invariants get uh, um, quite a bit complicated, right? So, um, yeah. So one of the things that you will see, right, uh, as an aside here is uh, even moderately complex algorithm for uh, verification becomes uh, quite complicated as you scale up uh, uh, the language with expressive mechanisms such as uh, manipulating heaps, right? And uh, really, the the um, nobody wants to. I, mean, I don't want to teach my um, say C programming. Um, like the student who is taking C programming, right, for the first time, about all of this, this is this is quite a high um, level of technical knowledge that is needed to even uh, reason about uh, all of the pieces, know what all of these pieces mean, and to actually come up with the proof is quite complicated. Hence, I think uh, all of the techniques that are being explored with automated verification, right? So you write a program, you somehow get this automated proof that. Uh, um, your uh, program satisfies some sophistication. There are lots and lots of techniques here, right? But uh, um, so typical level of proof burden for uh, simple programs, right, is uh, at least an order of magnitude or more, right? That's the state of the world. But a lot of tools like Infer and so on are, in fact, uh, making this smaller and smaller and smaller. Right, so you are uh, you might give up on uh, say completeness. Um, it cannot handle all of the programs. It might handle a subset of programs, but uh, they are they are becoming very very effective. Right. So, uh, but they are built up. I mean, the, the point I want you to take away is that uh, they are built up on uh, these techniques plus some clever the optimizations and clever software engineering um, decisions. Right. That uh, people have. Uh, taken for pragmatic reasons, and they are very effective. So full formal verification, such as this one, like um, full functional correctness is not the only end goal of program verification. You want all sort of techniques, right? You want to mix these sort of verification techniques with, uh, say, testing, right? If you can combine testing with uh, verification and make your uh, test coverage more complete, then that is also a, a very pragmatic end goal. Um, yeah, keep that in the back of mind. So um, it is not that uh, just because uh, um, I teach you everything, this is the only way to do it, right? So this is sort of the fundamentals. And as you expand, uh, as you take these ideas and you apply it, say, uh, somewhere in the real world, it doesn't need to be encoded in code, right? You sort of take these ideas and you, sort of, you have to make them more pragmatic with some additional um, help or the uh, trade-offs, right? So you lose something, but you gain um, programmability. Right? So that's the idea here. OK, so let's keep going. I think uh, um, we have one little section more to cover. So what's that? The idea here is that uh, so far we've seen big step semantics only, right, for board logic. And as you know that uh, big step semantics can only deal with um, uh, terminating programs. But our programs are non-terminating. As we've seen, we've written lots and lots of programs that are non-terminating, including including um, uh, some non-trivial ones, right? And most of the real-world programs are non-terminating. Non uh, things like, sorry, let me take the fact. Many of the real-world programs are non-terminating, such as uh, web servers and all of these uh, services, right? Um, Software as a service things are non terminating. So they are actively on. So, how do you actually deal about them? They also have concurrency and so on. So, you want small step semantics, right? And naturally, you can extend whole logic to small step semantics as well. So, yeah, so here is the small step operational semantics. 
they are uh, uh, for this language, right? And uh, they are pretty straightforward. So if you have an assignment, you extend the assignment here. Um, the difference with small step semantics, um, just to recall our knowledge, is that uh, um, the it is a it is a transition from uh, um, heap valuation command. So earlier it used to be valuation command to valuation command. Now because we have a heap, we have a our small step is a transition from heap valuation command to a heap valuation command, right? And at every step, we are going to tell you exactly how to take one step. For assignment, you sort of uh, extend the valuation and the command goes to skip. For uh, write to the heap, um, this part is the same as what we've seen earlier, right? Which is that interpret E1, interpret E2 in H and V, and you update the position in the heap at E1 with the value for E2, right? Valuation remains the same, the step goes to skip, right? And uh, this is for sequencing. So if the um, C1 is skipped, then you go to C2. If C1 is uh, uh, not skipped, right? Then you can take a step from C1 to C prime, C1 prime. Then the whole command reduces to uh, C1 prime C2 with the H prime V prime that is obtained by taking a step in C1, right? Uh, for if we have two rules, one for uh, the true case, if if uh, the interpretation of B is uh, true, then uh, you you sort of uh, uh, reduce this whole thing to just the C1. If the interpretation of uh, B is false, then this reduces to C2. For while, um, if uh, B is true, then you expand it to C semicolon the original while loop, right? Where C is the body. And uh, when B is false, all of this evaluates down to skip. Assertion is uh, similar to before, right? You can take a skip from assertion only if assertion holds on H and V. If, you, if this assertion does not hold, you cannot take the step, right? So that's the idea here. So uh, we've studied this idea of invariant safety, right? So we said, uh, um, in Lambda Calculus, for example, we had this uh, idea that uh, um, this this notion that simply type Lambda Calculus, if you can assign a type for a particular uh, term, then the term does not get stuck, right? And the stuck uh, thing there was um, um, you have an expression such as uh, 0 plus uh, uh, Lambda XX, right? This term is stuck, but this term also not does not have a type, right? You cannot give it type for this term. So what is an example of a, so our our language here, the language that we are studying here also has this notion of a stuck um, term. And uh, everything else is, can actually take a step. The only thing that gets stuck is this assertion, right? The idea here is that um, if you see this reduction, it says that uh, when the assertion holds, then you can take a step. Right, so there is this very nice uh, analogous property between how we've studied uh, that the simply type lambda calculus terms do not get stuck, and how we are going to sort of relate the whole logic triples to um, the small step semantics here. So the invariant safety that we are going to um, claim here is that. Uh, if the uh, so we haven't yet seen uh, this um, uh, whole logic extension for uh, small step semantics, uh, yeah, actually, actually no. So it uh, it's the same, right? So the definition of PCQ is remains the same. It's 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 only that we are giving a dif different semantics for the uh, the small step reductions, right? So so what are, what are we claiming here? We are sort of relating this. So the anal analog here is that uh, we have typing in uh, simply type lambda calculus, and we say that any well-typed term does not get stuck. Here we are saying that um, if you can have a term which has a prop which on which uh, this precondition P holds, postcondition Q holds, right, and um, P holds on some H V. So you pick some arbitrary heap and value on which uh, um, P holds, right? 
then uh, for the for the transition system that you can construct with hpc unstuckness is a invariant so it does not get stuck it will never get stuck at uh, assert right this is a very interesting property right so um, yeah so let's uh, let's actually see how this is the case right so um, this is uh, this is quite uh, intricate so let's uh, let's actually go through it um, in a little bit of detail i'm not going to go through it in full detail but uh, what you, what i want you to sort of take away is that uh, this particular uh, um, core triple is like the type system right the type for the term and um, I'm going to claim that and this in combination is the type for the term. And I'm going to claim that, uh, um, yeah, so you can have, uh, you can have uh, unstuck being a property for uh, the transition system that is constructed out of uh, HVC. And uh, the other um, observation that I'm going to make is that uh, we had seen progress and preservation in Lambda calculus. We have a very similar uh, idea here with progress and preservation, right? Um, what did the progress theorem say? If a particular term is well typed, you can take a step, right? Um, either the term is a value or you can take a step. So that was what uh, we had um, uh, studied there. And similarly here, if PCQ holds and PHV holds, right, the precondition holds on H and V, then HVC is unstuck. So, which means that uh, C is already a skip, in which case you can't take a step, or uh, uh, you can, in fact, uh, take one step of the reduction. So, this is, is exactly progress theorem. The preservation theorem, there, uh, if you recall lambda calculus, the preservation theorem said if you have a term with type T and you can take a step, right, from say, let's call the term E, you can go from E to E prime, then E prime also has the same type, right? Here, what we are going to do is uh, something a little bit different, which is that uh, if you have uh, the whole triple PCQ, right, and you can go from HVC to H prime, V prime, C prime, and actually the precondition holds on H and V, you've taken a step, right? What is the analog of uh, saying that E prime also has the same type? Here, we are just saying that we exactly know what the new precondition is. Right, and the precondition is very simple here. So all it says is that uh, for the precondition, you just take the state here as exactly equal to uh, what you get using this step. If you use that precondition, then this precondition, the new command C prime Q holds. Right, all I'm claiming is that you take a step. I I have now come up with a new P new new core triple. Right. Um, that is uh, relating the precondition here to the condition here. Right? So this is very similar to what we have done, where we say if E has type T, E takes a step to E prime, then E prime has type T. You don't have this notion of a type. We have to sort of uh, find a precondition, new precondition. And I'm claiming that uh, the precondition that you can have is very simple. It just says that uh, if you pick the new precondition as H prime V prime, if PCQ held, then uh, this also holds the new um, Q can be arbitrary, right? You can say this whole thing is sorted. The whole thing uh, is a permutation of uh, the input list and so on. But I'm claiming that if you can actually go from P to Q, then the same thing holds here, right? Is what I'm claiming. Let's, uh, uh, yeah, so let's see whether this is the case, right? Um, so, Let's switch to the cock development. Right. So I have a small step semantics here, right? So which is uh, heap valuation command to heap valuation command, right? And uh, the semantics itself is very simple. Um, yeah, we don't use the invariant in, uh, in here. And assertion says that uh, the assertion has to hold, the assertion step says the assertion has to hold where uh, assert A simply reduces to skip. Otherwise, it's very straightforward, right? So let's do that. And what is the transition system? The transition system here is, uh, uh, 
is a heap valuation command, right? A triple with heap valuation command. Um, yeah, okay. And uh, and yeah, this is the same as uh, what we had seen uh, earlier, right? So earlier we had valuation command, now we have the heap. So the in the transition system, the state is going to be um, just the initial state. And the step function is going to be the step function here. This is also deterministic and so on, but that is not uh, important here. And similar to the unstuck definition earlier in um, uh, Lambda Calculus, where we said uh, something is unstuck if it is already a value or it can take a step. Here we are saying that uh, a state is uh, um, a state is unstuck if uh, the state is skipped. Uh, the command is skipped, and there exists a transition from, uh, or there is this, or there exists a transition from ST to ST prime. Right. One thing you should uh, that should sort of uh, look very odd here is that I'm saying second of state, right? But I have three components here, right? So this is odd because um, um, cock doesn't actually have uh, um, arbitrary um tuples with uh, um arbitrary uh, elements right so it only has pairs you know it does not have triples it does not have uh, uh quadruples and so on so everything is sort of written this way so even when i write uh, something like this with three components it's actually it is actually this way right so first uh, binds the stronger and then says okay all of this bound to this command so so yes so that's the reason why i am writing second of state here second of state is going to be the command here right and if you want to access the heap you will access first of first of uh, the state if you want to access the valuation you will see that we will access this as uh, uh, the second of the first of state right okay so that's keep that in the back of the mind um, so that's unstuck. Yeah, so now we are going to do the progress and preservation, right? Here's the progress. Here's the preservation theorem. Um, the progress theorem says that uh, if I have PCQ and uh, for some H and V, so for some H and V, uh, PHV holds, then uh, unstuck is a property, right? HVC is a uh, property. So let's see how that is the case. So, um, okay. So the way I go through this proof is uh, I, I use uh, induction on uh, the definition of PCQ, right? We have a we have a derivation for uh, what uh, uh, the whole triple is, what the definition of whole triple is, and for each of the commands. Right, I'm going to sort of uh, uh, use that here. Just one second, I'm getting repeated calls. I'll just uh, mute that. Yeah, this is not someone that, uh, I mean, this call can wait. Okay, so I do induction on it. I unfold the definition of unstuck here, simplify propositionally order. This makes uh, simple cases go through. You can walk through it if you want. Right, so let's just look at a few interesting cases. So now I have um, I have a sequencing. That's the property that I'm looking at. So I have uh, uh, two induction hypotheses corresponding to C1 and C2, right? And uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is to actually uh, use the first induction hypothesis, right? It says that if PHV holds, then unstuck HV C1. So C1 is unstuck, right? So let me first apply that on uh, the H1 hypothesis. Right, let's do that first. And we know that uh, C1 is unstuck now, right? Let's unfold uh, unstuck here. When you simplify, we have a disjunction here, right? So you will see that uh, uh, this is simplified. If you do first order, we have one additional goal because uh, C1 can either be a skip or uh, it can take a step. So that's the reason why um, we get two sub goals, additional sub goal. Right. So when C1 is a skip, we can do the substitution. We know that this is going to step, right? So this command, 
this command is going to step. So essentially, this we know that's a step here because that's the that's the first of the uh, step function for uh, uh, sequencing, right? So E auto makes it go through. The second one says uh, I can actually step C1. So how do I know this? Um, I, I I know this, right? So this is this is actually stepping C1. So I'm going to what do we have to show? This is obviously not true. This is this is going to be false, but this is going to be true, right? If uh, if C1 can take a step, then C1 semicolon C2 can take a step. So let's just uh, first. Uh, um, get what that uh, result of the step is, right? So for this, I need to first uh, destruct x in order to learn that it is a triple, right? So when I destruct x, I get a pair actually. And as I said, right, there is there are no triples, there are only pairs in the uh, pop. So I get a p comma c. I can destruct p again to get uh, three things here, right? H zero v zero c. Um, I'm going to show that uh, I can take the right step. That's fine. Uh, e exists. I'm going to uh, apply so that uh, I'm going to find the assignment for ST prime. And that is going to become a unification variable. right? Now you apply constructor. Um, this is going to ask me to show that uh, C1 can actually step. And uh, yeah, E assumption makes it go through. It uh, unifies with uh, the term here. OK, so that was sequencing. Then we need to do, um, we need to do um, the, the uh, ones for uh, if, right? When is if. So there are two cases here. So the first case is when uh, uh, the predicate evaluates to true. The second is when predicate evaluates to false, right? So I'm going to do cases on it so, so that I'm, I'm going to handle each one separately. Actually, once you do cases, everything just falls through naturally. So I encourage you to do it and look at it in detail. So that's the idea here. So um, E auto actually makes both of the cases go through. And similarly, I have a similar one for uh, while as well. Um, e auto makes a simple case go through, right? Um, the for the final one, um, you will see that. Uh, what we have here. Um, this is the rule of consequence, right? So that's the last case that we end up having. So I see H0, which can go from P prime to P, right? And then I need to go from, uh, I need to go one step as well, right? So I'm going to sort of uh, first go from here to here, right? In H2. So I'm going to apply H0 and H2. So I learned that uh, I have PHV. Right, and uh, given that I have PHP, I can learn that uh, C is in fact unstuck. Right, so when you do that, you get unstuck of C. So which means that uh, uh, if you unfold unstuck, you will learn that uh, the second of uh, C is a skip. Right, the second of uh, C is a skip. Of course, again, recall that uh, this is a pair. And second of all of this is just going to give you skip. So that matches this obligation. And this one is just uh, uh, syntactically the same as this one. So if you simplify and first order, this goes through. right? So we've done uh, the um, progress case. There is a there is an interesting, so when, when we actually um, looked at simply type uh, lambda calculus, right? Um, we needed to, we had the syntactic class of values and value set types. So we have to have uh, something similar for um, um, values here, equivalent of values here. The equivalent of values here is skip, right? The skip thing. And uh, the equivalent of type is this whole triple. And what is the property that we can show for uh, a skip? Given, um, given that the command is skip, if uh, the precondition is p and postcondition is q, given that skip does not change any of the pre and postconditions, it must be the case that uh, p must imply q, right? PHV must imply qhv. This is very simple, right? So um, 
you can you can prove this by induction on uh, one uh, and e auto so that goes through right this is required uh, as a separate lemma so that is the progress lemma and for preservation our idea is that uh, as i said uh, we want to show that small step semantics actually preserve the existence of triples or triples right um, small steps preserve the existence of triples. There, the uh, preservation was uh, uh, if you if you have a well typed term and you can take a step, then the um, target term also has the same type, right? So that's the idea there. So yeah, so if you have a if you have a whole triple and you can take a step, right? And the precondition actually holds on HV, then uh, the new quadruple is in fact uh, just saying h equals h double prime and sorry the uh, the new quadruple is uh, essentially uh, just saying that uh, for h prime h double prime b double prime which is the um, argument variables here they are exactly the same as h prime b prime which you obtain by taking a step right so this is this is actually quite wonderful right so if you um, if you sort of think about it, uh, all I'm saying is that uh, I'm 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 act I'm able to construct a whole whole triple for uh, if the originally that there, there was a whole triple that uh, was there. If I can take a step, then I can I know what the whole triple is now. Right. So um, that is uh, that is going to tell us uh, how to take a step and preserve uh, that uh, there is always a whole triple. So let's uh, let's go through that as well. So we put again for the proof we induct on one, right? We get a lot of uh, cases. The first one says uh, I'm going. I'm, I can take a step from skip, so which is not true. I will invert and make it false. So the second one says uh, I'm going to take a step in assign. I have some side conditions, but these are going to be. I, I know exactly what the meaning of uh, this is going to be, right? There is exactly one constructor that applies here. Let me invert it so that I learn what that step is. Let me simplify now. Um, what do I have here? I have skip here. Uh, what do I know about skip, right? I know that uh, when you do a skip, uh, um, you don't change the pre or the post condition, right? So sorry, you, you don't change the heap or the valuation, which means that the whatever the precondition holds must be um, strong enough to show the post condition, right? So let me actually strengthen the post condition so that uh, I will get uh, this precondition as the post condition first, right? Let me strengthen the post condition so that uh, this becomes a unification variable and apply the rule for skip, which means that uh, I will get the same uh, uh, precondition as post condition, right? Now I will have to um, prove this implication here, this implication here, right? So let's simplify. Um, I have p h prime v in my assumption. I have a v prime in my uh, uh, existential variable. So this v prime should be v, right? And I know h is equal to h prime. So uh, this is going to be just substitution, right? If I make this uh, v prime as v, then I can discharge this proof obligation, right? Hence, uh, I use exist tactic and I explicitly say the assignment, the substitution for V prime is V, right? So this becomes PHV. If you do propositional, this breaks the propositional uh, things here and then does the, and then we do the substitution, right? So I get uh, P, P H prime V, which is the same as the assumption here. So that goes through and uh, this is trivially the same. It's just the um, same thing, so that goes through as well. I've just gone through it in uh, in detail here, but in fact, uh, you could have just done invert of one. Uh, all of the thing that I do here is in fact uh, um, carefully applying either the syntactic rule or strengthening the post condition to make it go through. So HD actually makes it go through, and all of the work that I've done here is just e auto, right? So. In fact, for the next one, if you just do uh, invert HTE auto, the whole thing goes through. 
right? So this is very simple. Um, I could have done the same for this one as well. Uh, that would also have worked. So let's look at um, let's look at uh, one more. So what do we have here? We have um, um, so we are going to look at the sequencing. Let's invert this and simplify. So there are two cases for sequencing, right? If you think about it, uh, uh, there are two ways in which uh, sequencing can take a step. The first one is uh, when C1 is a skip. The second one is when C1 can actually take a step. So we will get uh, one additional case because of that. And in the first one, uh, C1 has uh, gotten a skip, right? So this is not applicable, but uh, anyway. Um, yeah, OK. So that's why we have two cases. So what do we have here? We have, uh, um, so we are we are going to apply the consequence rule here in order to make this uh, go through. So HD consequence is uh, um, is the is the uh, you can check what it is, right? Check uh, HD consequence. So HD consequence is uh, precisely uh, strengthening and weakening um, both the um, both the sides, right? Both the precondition and the postcondition. So we are going to apply that rule, um, and E auto makes it go through um, simply. And then for uh, for the next one, uh, we have uh, what do we have here? We have h equals h prime, and then uh, v equals v prime. So propositional and substitution will help me arrive to q h prime v prime. Um, yeah. So here is uh, where uh, you will see that uh, I'm using the skip rule, right? So I have p skip q. It must mean that p implies q, right? So this is what uh, we learned. Um, in this step here, right? When we have p skip q, that's the that's the thing that I learned there. So if you if you um, and what do I have? I have p h prime v prime. So because of uh, the skip rule here, um, p must imply q, and I have p here. I ha I'm showing the same q. So in fact, if I just apply portable skip, um, I have to. I have to find some assignment for p that is this p, right? So e assumption, and I just need to show now p h uh, prime v prime, which is p h prime v prime here. Okay, so yeah, so I think uh, I'm I'm not going to go through the detail of uh, the rest of the proofs, but uh, they are very similar in uh, principle right so they are very similar in uh, uh, in what they do so you just uh, um, i will leave that as exercise because uh, it is not useful for me to go through all of that in detail okay so what we've done is uh, we've um, we've also proved the um, preservation rule as well in addition to progress so if we open up um, Say lambda calculus lecture. So the last thing that we did is we actually proved uh, um, soundness, right? So using um, let's that's that. Let me just step back. Okay, so here. So I proved uh, safety, right? Type safety as uh, invariant, where I used um, uh, invariant weakening, where I said uh, the I'm going to use um, the typing relation as the stronger invariant, which I'm going to show, which will in fact uh, uh, give me. Um, so I will I will show that uh, this is in fact an inductive invariant, and this inductive invariant in this will in fact imply imply unstuckness, and I will use preservation and progress, right? So which is precisely what we'll do here. 
the reason i open that is uh, it is going to match uh, um in a very similar state so um the first thing that we do here is also invariant weaken right after simplification so we do simplify here invariant weakening and the thing that uh, we do here is uh, uh, for our invariant right what we choose is uh, um for every reachable state right h prime v prime c i say that uh, um h h so the the position here right the, the heap and the valuation of that state is going to be uh, h prime and the valuation is going to be v prime and uh, if you take that as the precondition then uh, you can you can go all the way to the post condition which is true right i am going to show i am going to take this as the invariant i am going to show that uh, it is in fact in fact an uh, uh, inductive invariant that applies to all of the states right the initial state and all of the reachable states um yeah so that uh, goes through so i i, I will not cover uh, the whole of the um, proof but ob observe that uh, our preservation lemma which is uh, this whole triple step right which is uh, whole triple step here which is the preservation lemma is what i use here right and which is the same as uh, use of use of preservation here of course there are some details which are different but uh, but that's the in principle they are the same right and uh, similarly i finally show that uh, uh, the last uh, goal is true using the progress lemma this is in fact the progress lemma right and that's the progress lemma there and that also goes through so what i've actually shown is that um, um what we've done is uh, very similar to what we have here right that um, if a term is tight then uh, unstuck is an invariant for the transition system e if a term has a whole triple pcq and you start with some hv where the precondition holds then in fact unstuck is the invariant for the transition system that is constructed here right so the what i want to take away is this analogy right which is um, types are just one way of adding safety right and this is uh, the fact that whole logic uh, proof is uh, uh, sort of take, talking about more uh, um, more complex properties than just simple properties uh, like uh, uh, types right is quite nice because uh, uh, you can always simplify it to talk about some some property which is similar to types right so this is this is uh, this is quite nice but what can we actually use it for right so recall that um, we can reason about uh, non terminating programs using small step semantics right which we cannot do with big step semantics so here is a very uh, simple program it's not doing anything useful uh, it says uh, initializes i and uh, n to 1 and there is a loop where uh, i multiply i by 2 in every iteration and n is going to be n plus i right and all i am claiming is that uh, at every iteration of the loop n is going to be greater than 1 and uh, my loop termination condition is uh, um, zero is less than i right and this is because i is always going to increase uh, this loop never terminates right so i have to show that in an infinite program this assertion always holds right and i also need to show that uh, uh, this assertion here right which is deriving false here this last assertion means that uh, i cannot reach to this point so this assertion will not fail right so if i reach to that point then i can assert false and the program will uh, sort of uh, um, not step get stuck there right but i'm going to show that uh, my program will never get stuck there so for all of the reachable states uh, unstuck is a property right if it ever gets here it will get stuck because false is just a thing that does not hold so i will show that unstuck is in fact a property right so i have this uh, theorem which says forever is okay which says if you just start with true then i can never reach uh, false right which the other way to read this is the program does not terminate because if you if you are ever ever able to get here 
then you are uh, deriving false right so this is uh, this just says that the program does not terminate so the proof is very simple um, HD makes it go through yeah and then uh, even though I have uh, this assert which is false if I ever get here my program will get stuck but I'm going to show that uh, for my program forever right if I start with an empty heap and an empty valuation then unstuck is a property for every reachable state um, the reachable state is either skip which is not the case or can take a step right so um, it is a way of saying that this particular uh, statement is never reached so the assertion in the program is always preserved as well this assertion also gets preserved right um, because I'm talking about infinite states this also gets preserved so um, the proof is actually going to refer to the whole triple invariant, the safety proof that we just uh, proved here, right? Um, the proof is not uh, interesting, but the property is interesting, right? It is actually claiming that uh, my program is uh, um, always unstuck. It always runs and the assertion holds. I never get here. I, in fact, prove that with this lemma, right? And uh, that proof also goes through. Yeah, so yeah, so what have we done, right? We, we actually have this uh, nice uh, proof methodology in whole logic, which is syntax directed, but also has this rule of consequence combined with which we can prove properties about uh, non-trivial programs, right? Properties like sortedness and so on, which is what we've done with uh, selection sort. And this idea is very, very important, right? So um, this sort of lays the foundation for lots of di different techniques uh, that have uh, um, that are still being explored today so one recent not so recent but uh, very active uh, uh, research area is separation logic right so and concurrent separation logic so these are uh, these are closely related to how we think about uh, non trivial programs which also includes concurrency so think about Rust, right? Rust is a language that uh, avoids data races, but if you have races and everything around, can I still reason about the correctness of programs in that setting, right? Concurrent separation logic is uh, sort of an extension of whole logic, but also adds concurrency on top uh, to reason using more uh, primitives, uh, rich prim richer primitives for uh, reasoning about heaps. And uh, these are like open topics Right, so and uh, open research topics are actively researched and uh, they are highly relevant. Right, so um, we are going to see an instantiation of uh, this in uh, the whole logic in F star in the next lecture. So that'll be our last lecture. And what we'll do is we'll sort of study this in the small. Right, um, we won't look at uh, very large programs. I'll just uh, sort of uh, give you some ideas where you can go off and explore on your own right if you are interested in this topic and uh, we will study that the same logic that is embedded in f star and uh, we will prove programs uh, small programs just like this one we will prove uh, characters of small programs in f star and uh, we will um, uh, we will conclude our uh, course with that lecture and then I will release the assignment for compiler correctness and whole logic, uh, hopefully today. And then uh, I will release uh, one for a uh, very small one for um, uh, F star uh, FX, effect, effectful programming using F star using um, uh, after the next lecture. And we will conclude, right? And um, yeah, so the deadline for all of this is uh, end of May. Take your time, right? So if you want to prioritize your other assignments, do prioritize them and get back to that uh, later. So there will be a final exam, right? And uh, we will coordinate offline for the final exam. Um, yeah, so I'll stop here. So thank you. <laughs>